What's up, guys? It's Mike O'Geeky here. Episode one of the Mike Up Podcast. Tonight, I'm very pleased to bring you Dan. Dan runs Micropose. He makes filter patches. He makes uh, self-healing injector ports. He makes filter discs for your uh, grain jars. And we're going to get deep and we're going to get specific and we're going to figure out why his stuff is so amazing. So without further ado, let me welcome Dan. What's up, man? Uh, had to unmute. How's it going, guys? All right. So, Dan, hold on. Let me get centered in the screen here. Got to get used to this uh, tighter shot. It's got less. I can't do. I can't do my intro dancing anymore. All right, here we go. All right. So my experience with Micropose was pretty early on. I, you know, the the advertising gets to you, and you're like, oh, what is this? Let me check it out. Oh, uh, that's a little expensive. I'll stick with my uh my, my tape for a while. And uh, I could not get my tubs dialed in. And then finally somebody uh, convinced me I should give these filter patches a try. I put the three inches and some of the uh, one and a half inch on my tubs and have from at that point, they were the best grows I'd ever had. Uh, I was finally getting clean uh, filtered uh, air exchange going on in my tubs and couldn't been happier so uh, pretty early on, I said, let's get this guy in here and let's get deep and talk about what is going on with these filter patches that make them work so great. So how about we start with how you got into making filter patches for mushroom growers? Uh, so I started like pretty much everyone else. Um, I was doing some closet grows. Uh and I was having varying colonization rates for multispore um, in jars. And um, I guessed that it was probably just from different densities that I'd apply the pillow stuffing inside of the lids. And, uh, and it also took a long time for me to prepare all the jars and everything. So I was looking for a product uh, in China to see if they'd made something like that for any application that had a, an adhesive ring and then kind of like a filtration device. And I found that there was some auto parts manufacturers that did that for headlights. Oh. Uh, so the. Drop your milk. You're muted. Oh, there we go. The first thing I did was I asked if, uh, if they could change the adhesive in the filter material so I can achieve a specific micron and, yeah. and filter. And they, they obliged pretty quickly. So, okay. so I produced them and used them for myself for two years before I even let anybody knew that I know that I had them. So, wow. Yeah, they weren't even released for. I didn't really think of them as a product to sell. I was just like, "All right, great, they're useful. Now I have them." Uh huh. So, so you were sort of accidentally gatekeeping that technology for two years. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I had it, and I had it in like 2017, and and nobody knew about it except for me. So what what was the impetus to finally start selling them? Did you just have stacks of them? Did you start loaning them out to friends? Like what what switched? So at the time, their minimum orders were moderately high for my pocketbook. Mm -hmm. So I had to buy 5,000 units, and I knew I'd never go through them. Right, okay. Uh, so I just used as many as I could, and then after I stopped growing, I just had this mound of extra supplies. And so I was like, all right, well, let's give it a shot, see if anybody else finds them useful, so I can at least pawn some of these off on someone else. And so I made the Micropose Instagram and... And, well, I changed my personal Instagram to Micropose mm -hmm. and then uh, gave it a shot. And uh, the way that I got the word out actually was giving away like half of my supply to people that had a couple thousand followers, which was big at mm -hmm. the time, 20, 2019. It's pretty big at the time if you had 2,000, 3,000 followers. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, I was giving them out to those guys for free. And I said, all right, look, if you like them, then share them. And if you don't like them, tell me how I can make them better. You know, what's wrong with them? And then nice. it just took off from there. I feel like <clears throat> that's a lot of the stories for things that just work. You, you didn't, it, it just kind of happened. 
It's a whoopsie, man. (laughs) In a room and think tank this brilliant idea and then immediately execute it as a business plan. Just happened organically. You were initially just trying to solve a grow problem for yourself. Yeah. And said, I wonder if I can find this thing that doesn't exist, which in our mycology space is common. There's frequently not things made specifically for what we're doing. So we have to right. figure out, you know, what at the dollar store can I use to save myself money growing these yeah. mushrooms. So kind of cool. Uh, the next thing I ran into was the, uh, the injection ports. Mm-hmm. Um, so I was doing a lot of multi-spore with those filters. And I was like, well, it's still a pain in the ass to kind of bore a hole and apply those, uh, what are they, the butyl, butyl rubber stoppers or whatever that you put through the sure, holes. Yeah. So I was like, okay, maybe I can make an adherable one of these. And, and I tried that and that just came out. It was like six months later I did that one and everything and you, else was you, jelly rolled. You had the model already, which was, and you're a classic American in the sense, because if we have a problem, China can probably solve our problem. Exactly. Right? Exactly. They can. I was like, there's no other network of manufacturers like right. Alibaba. So it's like, all right, somebody on Alibaba has my answer. And then I yes. you know, I found a factory and, and got it and, done. And if you've ever in any other field gone to a, a, a U.S. fabrication shop yeah. and gotten a bid to have something fabricated, I used to uh, do architectural mill work and we used to get uh, – uh, shaper knives cut out by by this small company and i mean we were paying eight hundred dollars for a set of two or three knives it was just outrageous we kept trying to find somebody in china to do it for us but that was one instance where where we could not outsource that work but yeah so what in my experience if you're if you're doing something complicated where you're going to need a lot of support like uh, if you buy a machine but you intend on having a dozen machines maybe buy the first one in China, if it doesn't exist in the United States, Mm -hmm. but then you really want the support to be local so that you can hold people accountable and stuff like that. So you model the next subsequent machines after that one that you bought and have American manufacturers make them after that. So then you get the support because if it's a machine or something complicated, you can't afford to have somebody ignore you or like not, yeah, not fix it or something. Mm -hmm. Simple stuff like go China all the way if you can. Yes. But I mean, I, I've tried to buy my ZVS modules from Alibaba and uh, AliExpress several times, and about half the time they don't show up, and if they do, it's like months later. So you'd have to just sort of forget about them for a while, and yeah. then a uh, couple batches I had serious problems with them, uh, like more than half were defective, and when you go through the like return process, it never goes in your favor. So right, yeah, yeah, I just I, I stopped sourcing from them. Do you have a rep at a factory? I, no, I'm not that fancy, dude. Okay. So uh, what you do is you got to form a relationship when you find a good factory. You form mm-hmm. a relationship with one of the reps, and they'll keep keep contact with you at Alibaba or at uh, WhatsApp. Mm-hmm. And then you can like, hey, something wrong with my order. You need to fix it. And you know, they I they, do need that. Yeah, you gotta you gotta get someone. You gotta get a person. That, yeah. Because I love the idea of having Chinese people make things for me. I don't know what it is, but that sounds great because I can't seems, afford to do it here. Yeah, it seems more regal. Look, I'm an international yeah. superstar. You exactly. Know? <laughs> yes. Yes. Look what I've done. I need to like parlay uh, a family trip to China into really like me going to hang out at some industrial park in China for a while and try to find like the perfect place to make my new and improved scalpel sterilizers. That's what yeah. I need. You need to. You need to get a. A two thousand dollar suit and walk around Shenzhen yep. from factory to factory, just yep. putting your nose up and hmm. my chin always up this high. Yes, yeah, that's what I need to do. All right, man. So that's cool. Um, I love the organic uh, beginnings. Um, so since then, how has business been, and uh, what what do you have on the horizon here? Any new things going on? Um. So I haven't really told anybody about this, but I'm trying to get all the equipment to do everything in house. So I know that the price point's not going to be as friendly. My margins may shrink. Uh, but, you know, we did have some issues getting stuff in 2020, 21. Yeah. So I, I want to make sure to, to kind of close that, that, that uh, possibility from happening again. Who knows what's going to happen. Plus, since I'm obsessed with machinery, I kind of want things in house. So right now I'm, I'm just 
kind of bringing production in house, making relationships with 3M distributors in the United States and trying to source all the different filter materials and manufacturers here. So, so that's what, what we're doing now. We're spending money on producing in house yeah. at the moment. Yeah. But more control over production. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, more customization. No. I can make whatever you want, whatever size, you know, different materials, micron ratings. And... That's exciting. Yeah. So it's so, a lot harder to negotiate that and having to buy materials by two ton quantities of one thing, you know, you don't, right. you don't always want to do that. Cost too much. <laughs> and am I often saying like in the future, we could do like a rainbow ghost filter patch. Is that. If you can could find you do well, custom shapes, custom shapes. Absolutely. Custom colors. No, custom we'll shapes. To... I'm fine with just the shape. Yeah, I could probably I think do that. That would be yeah. fun. I like that. It's a good idea. All right. So for people who are not familiar, I'm going to simultaneously try to learn uh, my new streaming platform here and show everybody some cool stuff. Oh, look at that. So we're going to go down here and go to your site. Oh, I didn't even know this was on here. I was on private chat with us. Now I see the comments. There's people here. Oh yeah, man. There's people here. We're gonna we're gonna get into some questions here in a in a little bit. Sweet. So okay. uh, these are the lid filters. So talk me through why I should be using these lid filters instead of say the fancy one-way filters that people use or, or other Chinese knockoffs, like just tell oh, me those, what's those great about things. these. Yeah. The disc how much, things. how much are those space shuttle looking things anyway? How much do they cost? Uh, if you buy enough of them, they're not terrible. They're like 50 cents a piece or 80 okay. cents a piece. If you only buy like 10 at a time, they're, they're a little more pricey. I think they're about a buck a piece. Okay. Uh, well, I guess for starters, it'd be the price point. You can get those, uh, the lid filters for, I think, 12 cents a piece at the retail level. And they, they, your average flow hood operates at 0.3 microns under positive pressure. And mm -hmm. these operate at 0.3 microns at atmospheric pressure, which means that you're not forcing air through them. Right. So they'll probably have a better protection rating than your flow hood even because they're, they're not having forced air in them. Uh, oh, that's cool. Yeah, you can get... You know, four runs reliably on a steel lid. Hey, and everybody out there, stop using the black lids because there's recessed lettering on the black lids and there's a, it's also a bumpy surface. So when you're using these and they fail, I promise you it's because of the lid. It's not the filter. Uh, Are you talking about those like the heavy duty ball jar plastic lids? Yeah, there's people that message I me and say, your that. stuff sucks. Your stuff sucks. It didn't work. And I look at it. They show me a picture and the, under the... On top of the letter B, there's a filter that's on it. And there's recessed lettering. It's like, yeah, right. well, you've got like a half millimeter drop between the, you know, the filter's got to try and cover that. Right. You got to work on smooth surfaces. The white lids by Ball, are they by Ball? Anyway, they, the white I mean, they're a generic and, and Ball yeah. has some. Yeah, the white lids work perfectly because they're glossy. They're smooth. Yeah, so you want so you a, better a very smooth way. surface, yeah. Right. The steel yeah. lids and those plastic lids work just fine. And you can get colored plastic lids too. Just make sure the finish is glossy. Nice. But so, you get the same results every time. So if you guys are using pillow stuffing still, you'll have density differences, you know, mm -hmm. when you stuff one versus the other. And that's the problem I was having is you get some jars that are colonizing way faster because you went a little less dense. And then right. the ones that got more dense fill, there's not as much GE. So, so you right. get consistency every time you got the 0.3 micron rating. It does everything you need. So, and, and so, so I'm mm -hmm. going to try them out and, if they're like the Chinese crappy ones I bought, I had to actually put some on the bottom. So I put oh, them on yeah. the top and then I put it under the lid as well um, because otherwise I would occasionally have them come loose. Um, right. But you're saying these, I would only need to do them on the top surface. Right. And they should last four PC cycles. Right. And so, okay. So the reason, the reason that you're probably getting failures on some of those Chinese models is because they use a nylon non-woven, which isn't hydrophobic. So if okay. you put a water droplet on top of one of those filters, it sucks. It and you, no, on that, on, on mine, it just sits on top. You can move it around and watch right. it just go around. It stays in a bead, but, but if you're you put, on the others, right. If you, on some of the other ones, the nylon non-woven, if you put a drop of water on it, you can see it just sinks in. It only takes a, a couple seconds for it to start sinking in. 
So you have I, to have on, on something like this, you want to repel water, obviously, or you're wicking and contaminants. Right. Okay. All right. Moving on. We're going to do some other stuff here. Okay. Look at that. The whole thing pulled up. All right. Adherable injection ports. I heard somebody before this, uh, they call them ships, self-healing injection ports. I, I, yeah. I, it took me a minute to figure that acronym out, but I liked it. Yeah. It took me a, a few months to figure out what people were saying. <laughs> You're like, what are you calling my product? Tell me. Pieces of ship. Pieces of ship on top of the lids. All right, so I use the the Red Top uh, Super Hardcore Rubber, um, you know, the ones you talked about. The, yeah, the butyl. Your, yep. yeah, your motivation for making these. Yeah. And I can usually run them, I would say, depending upon how many pulls I'm doing on my liquid culture jars, maybe twice before there are so many holes in there, like two cycles of whatever liquid culture I put in where I need to replace them. Right. How many actual stabs should I expect to be able to get out of these, the self healing ports? Um, so I've got guys that run them alongside the lid filters. Mm -hmm. And so they're getting three or four runs and no problem. Uh, as far as the adhesive goes, since there's more surface area touching your jar lid, they last longer from a sticking standpoint. Okay. Um, but as so far it's more as the pokes, that... yeah, as far as the stabs go, I, I don't know the limit, but I've got guys that do four or five runs. No problem. Okay, so in so, general, all these four or five, three to five runs safely, right. which which then you're cutting the twelve cents a filter patch by three. I mean, per use cost is virtually nothing. Right, and and the reason for that is is since they're it's it's more of a foam than it is a solid plastic. So the butyl rubber is like a solid rubber, okay. right? So you yeah. get once you stick it through, it doesn't it's not as spongy, I guess. Mm -hmm. And so it doesn't heal as well. So these are more passive. So you don't get your needle bending the tips. of Your okay. needles don't bend. And when you stab through, since it's kind of a softer, spongier material, it just closes right around that hole. And so you don't notice the, the opening yeah. as much. So I opted for a, a more of a foam than, than a solid plastic. And I think that works better. Nice. So, yeah. One thing I get too is my, uh, my first stab I always push through this like miniature red core if I'm using a 16 gauge needle. So, so yeah, 18 gauge, I don't get that with the, the butyl rubber, but yeah, the 16 gauge is not ideal. Your plug, and, you're getting plugging. Yeah. I get the actual, like a biopsy of, of the, the port. What industry but, do they actually use those in? What are those for? That is an actual red top. I only figured this out because I, I work in healthcare and I use these tubes at work. Um, it's, it's like a non, it's just a dry blood tube. They call okay. them red top tubes. Um, they're not bad, but, but my issue with them is I have to change them out about every two cycles and, um, and I get the coring and I always wondered like if I'm coring it, then obviously it can't fully heal back. You, you know, if I'm, there's something missing, there's yeah. something missing, no matter how rubbery it is, I took some of it out. Right. So, so yeah, where's the foam? I can see how that would be more inclined to just spread away from the needle and then go back to its its original cellular matrix or whatever. Right. The, and if you if you still like using the red the butyl rubber ones, um, what you can do to kind of alleviate some of that concern of contamination if you're worried about coring is if you put them in at a slight angle, and you can do this with any injection port you use. If you oh. put it in at a slight angle, I know it seems unnatural, but you're not gonna you know, it's not going to be like a direct shot Straight right down. Now. Yeah. Yeah. So I I've used that technique too on some of those. Nice. But again, 50 of these 15 bucks, they last four cycles. So it's really like I'm getting a hundred. It's the same price. I I'm not by my butyl rubber stoppers are, are not saving me any money. They also work on bags too. So you're not, you're not only, uh, you know, limited to jars. I, who's that guy? Uh, Jesse Noller uses them a mm -hmm. lot on bags. I don't know if you've seen his, his millet grain bags. So I have. He, yep. We yep. had him on. He, uh, I would say he doesn't hype up his uh, injection ports, uh, as well as he probably should, but yes, I, I know they're there. So, we're okay. Quiet guys. <laughs> that, that actually leads me to uh, another thing I want to talk about is I thought it was quite a testament to your product 
to see what I consider to be, while very expensive, without question, the most dialed in tub you can buy, max yield bins, um, that, that they chose to affiliate themselves uh, with your products. Do you want to talk about how that came to be and uh, what, what feedback they're getting using your products in conjunction with their products? Um, yeah, as far as I know that they've, they've had great results and they continue to sell them. Um, so my most popular one out of the three sizes, the one inch, two inch and three inch is the two inch. And that's the one that they buy. Okay. Um, and so they've done, they've done ad with, uh, like when people stuff them, the, the pillow stuffing that we were talking about before. So that's another thing that I kind of wanted consistency with is I was just, I was getting varied tub yields and, and uh, varying tub speeds and stuff like that. And I wanted something to kind of, so when you have something manufactured in a large sheet, it's all the same. The thickness is the same. There's no variance in densities. And so it just gives you consistency. And so when you're working with new genetics, you can kind of narrow down where your faults are. And so, you know, yeah, the, which, the which can be huge. Yeah. When, when, especially in mycology, variable. especially, yeah. you know, mycology, there's a million variables you have to consider. Yes. And so that was another thing that I wanted to make just to kind of limit variability. Um, I tried to get it as dense as I could within a certain thickness. There's a, there's a certain thickness that the, that the machines that cut those can handle. And okay. so I got it as, as, you know, within a reasonable thickness in the highest density that I could, and it, it ended up working out pretty well, but yeah. So it's just, that was, that's probably one of my bigger hits. I, the tub filters, everybody likes the tub filters. Yeah, man. I love them. I, I, I can't even the first time. So my very first one, I had too many holes, um, which was fine. I just had to do a little misting. But then once I figured out the number of holes to have, I mean, I spawned a bulk and I didn't touch that thing until I harvested it. And, and they were just gorgeous fruits. It, it was, I mean, I felt like I had arrived in mycology and it was all it was not me. It was those filter patches. Cause at the end of the day, when these things are growing, they need, they need air. Yeah. yeah. And you can fart around with, you know, uh, micropore tape, but I don't know if you've ever looked at micropore tape under a microscope, uh, comparing uh micropore tape to one of your filter patches and I'll have to, I'll have to do some pictures and post it. Oh, you've done it. You've oh, taken... yeah. Yours look like a filter. And the tape, you're like, how is this working for anybody? This tape has these huge holes. It's crazy. The tape. So I've always heard that they're not passive enough. Mm -hmm. The tape. Is that what it is? It, what do you what's your opinion? No, on using I, the tape? It just seems like way more contaminants can get through. Oh, OK. So, so in, unless I was at a minimum doing two layers, um, I would not be convinced that stuff isn't getting through there. Yeah. So the, the tub filters, they don't really have a micron rating because it's – so a tub filter is supposed to emulate uh, pillow stuffing. That's what I was trying to get, okay. you know. Um, so I actually – I don't have a micron rating for it but I had it micron tested to find out what the rating is. Mm -hmm. And it's like 20, 20 microns or something like that. Right. So the, the purpose of the filter is just kind of maintain humidity while allowing airflow. Mm -hmm. So when you, when you're actually reaching the tub stage, most people aren't, con, are, they're not worried about contamination at that point. If they have a good ratio of, of sure. grain to spawn and you're in decently clean conditions and, and stuff like that. But the, the problem I heard with micropore tape is that, they're just not passive enough. Like you're suffocating your mushrooms. Oh, that's, 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 a, that's what I've heard anyway. I don't... Yeah. Okay. I mean, for sure your product lets more air through, but from what I was witnessing, it seemed like somehow it was simultaneously letting more air through, through what I experienced in my grows. But yeah. also I have never had a tub that use your, I have a few, I have like 14 of the 32 quart tubs. And I think I still have three of them that, that I have, I just haven't reordered my, my filter patches from you. So I still use micropore tape on them if I'm running those and the tubs with your patches, I have never had a contaminant ever in 
whereas the micro posts I, I do. And maybe that's just because I'm having to open them more and dial them in a little bit. Okay. I, I, do you do that. you do misting and fanning too? If I have to, if yeah, yeah it, I don't ever want to do that, but yeah, you if you're using micro pore tape, you I think you tend to have to do that. Yeah, I, a little bit. I, I I hate it, but yeah, it has to be done. Whereas with your patches, dude, you have to do anything. It is amazing. I'm wondering what the uh, what the rating on if anybody's done a rating test on the uh, micro pore tape. Yeah, that'd be interesting. Right. So I know I know how it's manufactured. It's it's like a it's made for medical tape. Like if you have an yeah. injury, you put it on right. top. So it's made so it's to breathable. Like, yeah, it's breathable. But mm -hmm. they have a painted on adhesive. It's like a liquid yeah. adhesive that yeah. that goes over it. But but that breaks down as it gets moved and manipulated and all that stuff too. So yeah, yeah. Okay, P Funk said that he's he's tried to find a rating on it, but he, he never found anything. Yes. I've never, I've looked really hard and I haven't found anything. And I, and it's, it's probably because it's not used in a, it's a wrong fashion. application. Yeah. Right. It's, it's they don't really care about the rating. It's not really important to them, but I've looked for it. I couldn't find anything. I'm sure I could get it tested independently if I sent it off somewhere, but I haven't done it. But spending money to disparage micro pore tape when everybody already knows it's not the ideal you don't it doesn't even matter certainly not for jars if you want to take a risk on a tub it may work but on a jar don't do that don't do that <laughs> um <clears throat> all right actually somebody oh somebody had a uh phil arid had a question what would happen uh if i doubled up my micro pore discs like if they were trying to choke it down a little bit i think is what they're getting at um so doubling up on a, a disc to, oh, to lower uh, the FAE. Like I, my guess would be maybe for an Enigma Grow or something okay. where you wanted to decrease the amount of fresh air exchange. Have you ever heard of people doing that? So he's not talking about jars. He's talking about in the tubs. I believe, but I don't know. I'll hopefully if if I'm misinterpreting his question. Yeah, are we doubling up on jar lids or or tub filters there? Well, just answer both that way. Uh, you saw it on both. So jar lids, um, they're the the jar lid filters are made to be as passive as possible while still, you know, filtering at a micron rating that keeps everything out. Mm -hmm. So it's very restrictive already. If you if you doubled up on um, the jar lid filters, you might you might get stalling depending on how okay. aggressive your strain is. Like oysters, super aggressive, you may get stalling on that, and you'll have to you know it's got to breathe. Right. Um, so with those, I'd keep it a single. I wouldn't really. I wouldn't really double it up uh, with the tub filters. Since they're not super restrictive, it's not a, a really low micron rating. Mm -hmm. You're not going to actually see much depreciation and airflow with one or two layers. Oh, so okay. if you wanted to do that, it wouldn't make much of a difference because the air that's going through it is so slow moving. You don't really feel the restriction in air until, until you're trying to push. Yeah. yeah. You're trying to push a bunch of air and then, you know, it's kind of fighting back. Right. But the air is moving so slow, it's it, it wouldn't make much of a difference to double up, it, I don't think, on your, right, okay. on your tub filter. It, it gets through there anyway. But right, you could – so technically, you could – and I did this one time, actually. I just put micro pore tape over the your filter patches um, in the beginning because I wanted to choke out the – the cake so that it would right and then right. i took that off and so i i do that that's what i do so when the if it's the first tub that's never been used i'll put tape on the outside and then once it's ready to fruit i'll remove the tape put the micropose filters on but if i want to reuse them for the next cycle what i'll do is i'll spray them through with like a bleach solution mm -hmm. and then once everything's clean the tub's clean and i want to do the second run i just tape the insides of the holes with duct tape or something ah, and okay. then when it's ready to fruit you just peel the duct tape off your filters okay. are already there so that's that's how i manage you know multiple runs with the same filters it's just nice. yeah. so that brings me to another question so when i clean my tubs i just wash them and clean them like normal i don't i pretend like your filter patches are not even there i leave them on and i make sure i rinse it really well uh usually in the shower with a you know a hand wand or whatever yeah. and then before i go to use them i will spray the crap out of them with iso and get them saturated and then let them dry okay have you noticed any adhesive issues when you spray with ISO? i have not i, I i've probably run these tubs four cycles and they're still fine 
Okay. There's some guys that were spraying with 91% ISO and they say that it dries out the adhesive and it, you need to get peeling up. I I don't have night. I use 70%, but okay. I have not had that. Um, but so what is your recommendation on cleaning them or how, when should I plan on replacing them? Kind of my maintenance on, on those patches. How should I handle that? So I've personally run three and then retired them okay. just out of kind of intuition, I suppose. Mm-hmm. I don't, there's not really a set, a set amount. Um, I tend to use like a 10% bleach solution um, because I know it's not dry. I've never really mm-hmm. run the alcohol, so I can't speak to if that's like an isolated insulin incident or not. But mm-hmm. so in between uses, I use dilute bleach and I spray them heavy air dry in a clean room, probably one that's been scrubbed by a, a flow right. hood and a fan or something. And then I just reuse after that. Okay. Had no issues. Yeah. All right. Got as a question. But everything clean, it's, you know. Yeah. So my problem is every once in a while, I'll get a tub that contaminates and then I'll put it outside and I'll sit out there for a week or two before I touch it. So then I'm really like, oh my God, I got to just douse this filter patch and everything I can. Oh yeah. If you get a contamination in a tub. And- yeah. Throw it away. Just throw it away. Just, okay. Okay. Yeah. Cause you're, I have I not, mean, I've, I've reused them and they were fine, but I'm using inside, I'm using a, a 10% bleach solution. And then my final is the ISO. So I'm just okay. hitting it like hard. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I've noticed that, you know, when you, when you put something on it, like a chemical, it sanitizes, but it doesn't kill them all. And so right. if you do get air flow through the filter and you didn't kill something, uh, you, you know, you, you could be, dropping stuff on your cake Correct. i say i say as a standard procedure is, is if you do get a contam and those filters were used to just toss them okay it's you know it's not worth it yeah yeah i don't i don't want to be responsible for <laughs> dead tubs <Right. laughs> but yeah i just i throw them out if i get okay contam. all right so i got another question uh it's a little bit longer and i'm going to use a little new technique here because okay. again i'm just getting used to this uh program All right. So this question comes from P-Funk, one of my buddies. Uh, I have a legit question. Sometimes I have an issue with the injection ports not peeling if the backing or the backing comes off with the port. Any tricks for that? Regardless, they are my favorite. Oh, okay. So I switched from the paper backing to the new plastic backing. It's the same adhesive, and that should make it easier. Um, If you are having trouble with the plastic ones, the way that I, I think I have some close by actually. Let's demonstrate. Yeah. Okay. So there's a technique I use because they do tenaciously stick. So I've got some of the old models sitting next to me. It's a, the paper model. There okay. we go. So when I take them off, I usually grab it. Uh, let's see if I can center this thing. I usually grab it by the top here and pull it up and it disconnects on its own. But you have to kind of squeeze. You see how I'm doing that? Mm-hmm. That tends to be the easiest way to get it up. And you don't want to touch the adhesive because you want it to perform. Right. But Enough. if it's if you got a, if you got a couple of uh, tenacious ones, just kind of squeeze the top. Uh, it's hard to get centered on this thing. You just kind of squeeze it, and it just naturally pulls up. Nice. Okay. But the plastic models that I have are much easier. I switched them out because I didn't. You know, I kept getting ripped. It's just the adhesive is strong. <laughs> right. So. That's the, you know, that's it's the name the of the specific game. Yes. Yeah. You give something, you take something. Yeah. All right. Got another question here. And this one actually is kind of exciting. I've never thought about this. All right. James wants to know, has anybody, uh, Dan or otherwise, tried these uh, bigger filters with bags, adding some filtered FAE to a bag, perhaps? Um, I'm thinking he's thinking that once your bag colonizes, you might cut a big hole in it and then put one of those filter patches on it, which is kind uh, of so a, like the fruit in bag type thing. Yeah. Like a, like like a mono like, bag. Yeah. Mono bag, but using, have you ever heard anybody doing that? Okay. So there is a company that's doing that. It's actually one of my partners, okay. uh, one of my distributors anyway. So I'm sure most of you guys have heard of Midwest grow kits by chance. Yeah. Somewhere. Sure. Yeah. Okay, so they have a product out where they, they have a bag and then it comes with one of my filters. And I don't know if it's pre-attached. I haven't looked closely into it, but I know they're doing a mono bag with those tub filters on it. So it's not a bad idea. I'm I'm wondering how I didn't think of that myself. I, I will definitely be trying that out. Cause uh 
How would you make the hole though? Would you like, how would you, the hole in the bag? Would you like scissor it and then put it on and then seal the top or what? What would be the? I I would probably sterilize some sort of backer plate and draw it out and cut it with a scalpel and then place it right over that and then pull that, you know, that thing that I cleaned out. I'll do a video. I'll do it. And yeah, and I want to see it. The now video. I want to see how it works. Cause I, I'm that's, that's what I like doing is figuring out like the right uh, methodology for, for figuring all that stuff out. But I don't think it would have to be terribly complicated. Anything better than like right now, if I do anything, I just do a slit under the flap. Yeah. And it, you know, it's the way the bag usually sits. Sometimes I can like finesse it so that it's just like slightly open. I only do that once the cake is absolutely colonized. Right. No risk it, of losing her. Yeah. Uh, very little risk. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but this would be better. Um, I mean, having two inches of just exposed surface area that that I know I have passive air passive air exchange. You could even get real fancy, and you could have you know, one high on one side and low on the other side. How are uh, these guys getting these monsters? I've seen some, some fruited bag grows where these guys are just putting out some serious monsters and it doesn't, it looks like they're just running them on a normal sub bag. And then when they're ready to fruit, where they clip the top or something, there's guys getting know. tub yields in some of these 10 pound bags. Yeah. I mean, I've had some good grows, but I'm not hitting the numbers or quite the fruit size that some of these guys are growing. Absolute mammoth fruits in these bags i don't know what they're doing eight ounces um, dry on a bag like yeah. get out of here you kidding no. me yeah well so p funk says it's genetics that's true it's that's a um, lot of it right there that's a lot of it yeah and most, then so that's most of it <laughs> phil also says hi spawn so i can agree with that somebody told me early on oh because i was complaining about uh oh i can't wait until i get good enough to have uh, beautiful canopies like you guys yeah. they were like just run one-to-one -one spawn to sub ratio and and you'll probably get a great canopy and sure enough i i did yeah um, so, but now Jesse Noller will tell you that, you know, the bioefficiency of any given amount of grain, grain spawn to substrate will always ultimately yield the same amount of fruit that you're putting the same amount of ingredients in and that's what you're going to get out. So if you're putting more grain in, you know, a one to one ratio that you're just putting more food in there than if you're putting in three to one, which is kind of like uh, the standard go-to. So you know, I always thought of it as like sub is, is more water. of a carrier. Yeah. It, it adds nutrients a little bit, but it's more of a carrier and more of a network for it to run through that yep. most of and your, water, right. And water mm -hmm. and, and most of your, yeah, it's definitely a water carrier, but most yep. of your nutrients is coming from the grain, the grain. Yeah. And so, you know, and that's, that's another reason why you don't really get as many contaminations on sub as you do grain. You got to worry about grain because everything sure. wants to eat the grain. Everything wants to colonize there. Once you hit sub, you're usually straight. Correct. So yeah. I don't, I don't really think that there's, I don't know if I agree with that. But no, uh, the, the point is <clears throat> just the amounts. So if in it for, so say that you created a monotub that had a four inch cake and your ratio was one to three. Right you'd have a, a smaller amount of grain than if you had a four inch cake that was one to one, you know, you're going from having 25% of the vo total volume be grain to 50%. So you're doubling the nutrition mass. So, right. so that you, you theoretically would be able to all these basidio carps just want to form all the time because they have nothing but food. And I mean, I don't know how mycelium thinks, so I don't know what the actual, triggers are for pin density and stuff like that but right yeah i, I don't um, think that's that way across the board i think for actives and most of the substrates used for actives the the substrate's not as nutritive but if you're talking about for like yeah. like hardwoods and stuff like that obviously the wood is a nutritive substrate and right. so you know the more nutrients you're gonna have you're gonna you're gonna put out but i think if you have a higher grain ratio you'll probably end up getting higher yields because it's turning the grain biomass into mushroom biomass there's right. more food to feed it yeah you know the, yeah. the so I 100% somebody early on told me grain is your food substrates, your water don't overcomplicate it. But now these days there's some food in it. Everybody's it, trying to overcomplicate it and yeah. it seems to be working for some people. So, yeah. so I I'm willing to experiment. I, I'm still trying to stay open and 
I like to try stuff anyway. If I just do the same thing over and over again every day, it gets a little you get bored. Yeah. yeah. Once you've grown a pretty canopy, once you've grown a handful of them, you're like, okay, I've done that now. Now I want to do something different. Can I do it faster? Can I make them bigger? How much control can I have over what my, my fruit's going to look like? All, all that stuff. That's kind of my deal. Yeah. Um, all right. So I want to talk about one more thing, but I'm going to let the audience know. Um, please, we have a, a little comment section here. If you have questions for Dan, uh, put them in the comment section and we'll put them up here and uh, we'll we'll get to your question as well. But I got one more question for you. I know you have uh, a new roommate in your commercial space. I do. Yeah. And uh, he's uh, one of my favorite guys in mycology. I had the pleasure of meeting him at Spread the Spores in Detroit. Um, he has been nothing but uh, a source of information and uh, good humor ever since I got into this uh, crazy mycology community. Um, I'm talking about Tim of Tip of the Cat Mushrooms. Uh, he recently moved from more or less the greater Detroit area to your neck of the woods, and he's uh, now sharing some of your workspace is this correct yes he is he's uh he's pouring his plates out of the commercial building now and he's he's helping me do my orders and stuff like that so i can uh work on some other projects he's he's helped me a ton nice. probably he's much he's much brighter than i am so i feel like having his brain power there is an advantage for me i, I always feel like i'm spoiled now yeah he's but, a smart dude yeah he's um, helped me and, solve a lot of and problems. well read yes. yes very well read so do you guys have any I mean, obviously, I don't want you to let all the cats out of the bag, um, of course, unless you're throwing them over a bridge into a body of water. But yeah. w give us a taste of maybe some things you guys are thinking about doing, because I can't imagine you guys are not thinking about doing some some work together. Yeah, yeah. Uh... We had some some marketing collaboration ideas, uh, you know, passing back and forth. Uh you know, kind of help share our, our, uh, our audiences with each other. But, um, I don't, I can't really talk about some of the projects okay. we have. In. <laughs> All right. We, we want to finish up. Okay. So on my, I end, want I the wanna... Joan Rivers exclusive though, when you're ready to talk. Okay. All right. I'll, I'll come back on and, and kind of okay. go over it. But as of right. right now, I know everybody's, everybody's, I get serious. I'm not exa exaggerating. Probably like five to six messages a week about those silicone lid covers that I haven't mm -hmm. finished yet. So, um, so <laughs> I am working on that. Those are going to be finished soon. Um, I'm having Tim run some tests and he's going to give me some input on, uh, an issue that I was having. We'll just say that. So the reason it's not done is because there's one thing that was holding me back and he's, cause you want to get me... it right and you don't want to sell it. Right. I don't want, I don't want to release it. What the, I forgot who does this method. Oh, just release it first. And then, and then when you figure out what's wrong with it, then you make it better. And, and yeah, yeah, don't, I mean, don't product yeah. test, let the consumer test it. Yeah. Let the you. consumer yeah. test it. Well, I, yeah. I do the same thing, but I let, you know, my trusted people test it. You right. Know, some friends of mine test it and then they get back. Oh, this thing's shit. And this is why, but so well, he's going to okay. do that for me. I don't know about <laughs> the silicone lid. I don't think. Tell me, what are you talking about? Okay. So a lot of people still cover their, uh, their lids with aluminum foil because it keeps oh, yeah. water out mm -hmm. and it, you yep. know it's just it makes it so that your adherables are are uh, protected. Wait a minute, you're like gonna that. make a little silicone shower cap for my my quart jars? Yes. Yep. So oh, I got okay. a I got a, a standard and a wide mouth one coming out. That's it's kind. Of, I don't. Uh, do I have one here? I got a lot of stuff laying on this table. I you want to see it, Dan? Find oh, it. Oh, let's see if I have one. It doesn't look like I have one. No, I just, I think I gave the last ones to Tim today. Yeah, I don't have one here. Damn it. I'm going to call Tim and make him bring it over to you. But anybody, anyway, if you guys want to see a, it. That's I, a killer idea. And yeah. I mean, silicone, the thing should last for a, a really, Forever. really long time. Yeah, yeah they're not going to wear out. So they're, I've got them posted on my, my Instagram profile if you want to. All right. We got to do this. Jeffrey Nong. Yes, so, yeah, so precisely condom. what it's the jar condom. That's you know, <laughs> no, no putting any uh, any sprinkles or sparkles uh, on. It's exactly what it is. All right, Jeffrey will be at the Laugh Factory this week, uh, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. If you want to catch his show, I'll see you uh, there. Moving on. <laughs> All right, any more questions, guys? Oh yeah, so bonsai uh, fungi who does some really cool novelty grows. Uh, he said, "Bring on the reusables." I think so. 
I lived in LA for 16 years, uh, surrounded by eco-friendly, carbon neutral, you know, gender neutral, all that stuff. And I'm used to it and I'm all about it, but I'm actually, I have been surprised to see just how eco-conscious the, the micro community is. Yeah. And it's, it's pretty cool. And so I, I think anything you can do, because, man, I hate going to the dollar store and buying crappy aluminum foil. So yeah. the minute yeah. you have those things ready to go, I will be all over it. And so, OK, so with my products, I don't think we covered this yet, but everything that I have, when it can be had, I make out of 70 percent or higher recycled material. Nice. Um, the problem with filtration is there's really no replacement for plastics polypropylene and polyethylene and, and all the, there's really no replacement for it. And so if there was like a cellulose plastic that could withstand high temperatures that has the good micron ratings that you can also get in a hydro hydrophobic, you know, feature, then I'd be using that, but there's right. just not. So the best that I can do right now is just kind of having 70 to a hundred percent, which everything I think right now I got it narrowed down to a hundred percent. There's only one product. I don't think that quite is. Oh, the, the injection ports are, you can't get virgin silicone barely easily, but so I do what I can to make. <laughs> and I'm 45. I'm not getting virgin silicone anymore. I can tell you that right now. So, yeah. <laughs> so, but yeah, the, the aluminum foil, I'm trying to cut out the aluminum foil uh, to get the reusable lid covers. Cause I know a lot of you guys still use aluminum foil. It's I'm not going to lie. If it's even remotely affordable, I just don't like the process of aluminum foiling my jars yeah. anyway. Yeah. I, so I think even regardless, just on a usability factor that that will be pretty great. Yeah. Phil Arid said you can use old paper bags instead of foil. I do not have paper bags, but yes. Oh, PP that's, bags. That's uh, polypropylene oh, bags. Oh, polypropylene bags. Yeah. I so thought I was talking about paper bags. I was like, okay, but you I, you may be able to do that. You'd have to probably put a rubber band on there. So, Oh, grow bags. Yeah. On. Oh, okay. Yeah. 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 Man, you know what I do with my grow bags? Uh, I, I've been using another product lately. I'm getting like five to six flushes out of my, my bags. So by the time I'm done, I save them and they become my garbage bags for my, my house. I just, I put them like, you know, my little waste paper baskets in different places. They like, they're my, yeah, that's what I, I that's how I feel good about myself at night when I go to sleep. Yeah. I honestly, the, the biggest difference you can make is probably just in your own setup. I mean, it's just yeah. reuse as much as you can. Yeah. Try not to throw shit away if you don't have to, Yeah, you know, and some of these guys, you know, if you're using foil and that's the only thing you can use, cause the only logical solution at the moment, just reuse the foil. Don't, don't crick open a ball and throw them away. Cause as soon as you right. do that, you got to get more foil. In the aluminum industry, it's horrible. Yeah. It's not that plastics is much better, but you can do a little more in plastics. But yeah, right. just, you know, stop throwing away your aluminum. Try to reuse as much as you can. So good call. All right. Anybody got questions for us? I'm going to scroll back here and see if I missed any. Oh, okay. Brett Schaefer said, what about putting micropore over your uh, self-healing injection ports after more than three or four uses, like uh, as just a preventative measure? That sounds like a decent idea to me. It may work. Um, you'd prevent some airborne stuff from going mm -hmm. in. I've never tried it, so I couldn't. I couldn't speak from from experience, but that would probably work. If you want to get them to go a little longer. The other thing I was talking about is when I mentioned before, when you're injecting into your butyl rubber, if you do yeah, them at an angle, angle, yeah, just inject at an angle guys. You might, you might be able to get more runs out of it if you're concerned with, you know, overuse. So. All right. I have uh, uh, my buddy, Steve here. This guy has got some hilarious content. He posts the, the best videos on Instagram. Um, I love this guy. You guys should follow him. Um, he says, I have an Air Force micron meter for testing the size of metals. Would that work? Is he referring to the micropore know. tape? We I think this was, yeah, this was back tape? when we were talking about micropore tape. If so, Steve's still here, if he could clarify. But yeah, if you have, if it, if it measures particles, because there's machines, I know they force air through it. And what they do is they don't just measure particles. They measure the particle size. 
with a certain amount of airflow. So right. obviously the higher the airflow you have, the less it can filter out because you're increasing the force. Right. So there are the, the micron reading machines are usually the ones that uh, it's like this small disc on top of another disc and you mm -hmm. put the sheet in between the two and it measures the particles at a certain speed. And so if he's got one of those, then you should be able to test a uh, micropore tape to see what it's rated at. I'm curious I, to see if he, if he's got access to one of those, I really want to know. I will follow up with him tomorrow okay. for sure. Okay. All right. What else we got here? All right. For the culture, I had no clue they were hydrophobic. For the culture, I did not know they were hydrophobic either. I also didn't know the reason my Chinese knockoffs were not good was because <laughs> they were not hydrophobic. So that is, yes, I agreed. Yeah. There's only a select uh, few materials that are both hydrophobic that you can get at that kind of micron rating. So like uh, nylon, I think you can get a non-woven down to like 0.2 microns but that material isn't hydrophobic. Right. And uh, PET, uh, polyester is another one. And surprisingly, polyester doesn't have the heat rating and it's not hydrophobic. Well, we know that about polyester, right? After like kids got, didn't like kids got caught in house fires and like the, right. It literally it poops up like skin. gasoline. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's like terrible. Yeah. It's tough. no, no, no heat resistance whatsoever. Right. So there's only really a couple suitable materials. The one I found most suitable is, is uh, polypropylene non-wovens for essentially all of my products. Nice. So there's a little trade secret for you guys if you want to get in. <clears throat> all right. Oh, you know what? Um, I was going to ask you about. Let me go up here. I have never I'm sorry, I'm doing two things at once, which which I'm That's good. At. I can I can tackle a couple of these questions I'm seeing popping up too. Great. Uh, All right. somebody asked, are the agar punches still on your radar, Dan? Um, they are. I actually brought it up with Tim today and talked about it. Um the problem I was having is I have an engineer and he's a young guy and he's in New York. He's extremely busy and I got to drive a very long distance to see him every time I have to get something done because trying to do it over email and pictures, it just doesn't, doesn't work. work. And so I need to find a more local, I got to kick this guy and then get a more local engineer. Um, mm -hmm. And that's, that's the tough part. There's just, there's some, just some spacing issues, I suppose, with the internals of the, the agar punch. It's, it's, I've got working models sitting here, so it's not like it's not done. There's just some fine tuning stuff that I really need to get squared away. So yeah, it's it's on my radar. I know I've been I've been dicking around with it for two years trying to get it done, but it's I haven't forgotten about that product. <clears throat> All right, so I will let me just pull this back up. Gotcha. There we go. Tell me about these. I have never used these. I know some people do these or do the Tyvac. Um, is, is this like a relic product or are you still selling this product? No, it sells. Uh, tell me, tell me so why people was, are buying it. <laughs> so this was, a, this was a pride thing for me. Okay. Uh, <laughs> you, have you seen these before by another vendor? I have not, no. Okay, so I'm sure somebody knows where you can find these. So, so these, um, Paul Stamix made the original one. Um, they were 70 millimeter, 90 millimeter filter discs just like these. And he sells them at... Uh, fungi perfecti or fungi.com. Right, right. Okay. So when I used them, I was doing tests on them. So I was like, oh, okay, nobody else is making them. He seems to be the only supplier. Maybe I can get into it. And for the life of me, I could not find this material. I couldn't find anything compatible. And, and it, I just, nothing satisfactory. And I wanted to make mine better than his because if you put water droplets on his discs, they sink in. Okay. And it's, uh, you know, it's, it's not truly hydrophobic. Yeah. It just, it sinks in. So I wanted to make one better and I was obsessing over this for like a year. And at, at one point I was like, I don't care if it sells. I just, I want to figure it out. And so I found a, a I designed to help co-design a material that wasn't flimsy, but it, okay. it's a, it's a, a non-woven that I found that was hydrophobic enough. And I ended up buying way more than I ever needed because their minimum orders were just ridiculous. But 
So those are those are meant for um, like if you're doing live tissue transfers or grain to grain transfers where you don't need a needle. Um, gotcha. You can just kind of open the whole thing and you do your transfer. It's way easier to handle and everything. So those are more for for non injectable uh, transfers essentially, but they work fine and they're reusable. I've I've had guys that run them for ten generations if you're covering them and they're just durable. And theoretically, <clears throat> it should speed up colonization, right? That would be my guess. So this product actually puts you in more control over colonization okay. with with a fixed cost because under that white disc you see is holes in your steel lid. Ah, okay. I see what you're saying. So right, you would so, put this in conjunction with the steel lid. Okay. Right. So it's sitting on top of your steel lid. And if you want to speed up colonization, you just poke another hole. Or if you want more airflow or whatever works for your system – you can adjust that on your own, but you're not paying for extra discs because that's just, it's one disc. Gotcha. And so those are great for, you know, I've seen a lot of people that do cultures, they're doing wedge transfers and that's their favorite to use. Yeah. So. All right. I got to show this. <clears throat> Duckman 2020, 2020, 2020 just said, I bought this on <laughs> accident from you once. I've had people buy them from me thinking that they were the tub filters because they're big. And mm -hmm. uh, yeah, yeah. So it, it happens. <laughs> well, dude. Duckman, you gotta tell us if you ran them and how they work. If yeah, not, did you? Did send you them at least me. I want to try them. <laughs> yeah. All right. I think we got a few more good questions here. All right. Here we go. Uh, and let me get out of this screen here. Okay. Uh, Jeff, on a more serious note, what's the <laughs> functional difference between using your large jar filters over a lid compared to the small filter discs over a hole in the lid? Um. Okay. Control, so right. Well, it's, well, that's part of it. The other part is, um, so if you're running an injection port, you can't really pierce uh -huh. through those, uh, the big lid discs. And so, uh, it, it's, it depends on what you want really. Like I've run jars doing, uh, wedge transfers just with the small discs on there. But if you're running an injection port, you can't, you can't put them on top right. of the disc. So you want to run them alongside the smaller, you know, the injection port, and then you got your filter. But gotcha. it's it just it's your preference. If you wanted to do if you were doing strictly wedge transfers or or uh, you know live tissue transfer grain to grain to grain to grain, you can use either the small one or the big one. But you get the adjustability with the big one. You I get see. probably more runs out of the big one by far, and as long as you're covering and protecting them. So, all right, this was a good question. Uh, Brett wants to know: Are the filters designed <laughs> for a certain size hole? So, like, so is there yeah. a recommended hole size for everything? Right. So on the the 18 millimeter filters and the injection ports, they work best on a quarter inch hole, which is about I don't know, it's like six millimeters, I think. So six millimeter metric quarter inch uh, standard. And if you go any bigger than that, then what you do is you're losing. So if you have a hole this big, and your filter is only a little bit bigger. If you do too big of a hole, you're losing surface area of the adhesive, which right. is what gives you the strength and bonding. So you don't want to go over a quarter inch. So, but all right. You know, is that on there. your website anywhere or no? Uh, are we talking about the instructions? Oh, oh, so it comes in the instructions. I just thought maybe it would be somewhere. No, on I don't, I don't have any. It's okay. just an FAQ. I should probably start okay. adding more data on how to use. That was my subtle there. way of saying you should probably put <laughs> get your shit to together, brother. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, but they're selling, dude. I don't have to. It's okay. It's a um, lot to do. <laughs> so yeah, so these, uh, but I'm sure people can reach out to you. He, uh, I don't know if you guys know, but one of the things that made me instantly uh, love Instagram and dislike places like Reddit or Shroomery or honestly sometimes even Facebook with its extra baggage and and weirdness yeah. um instagram you can just reach out to people and just sh shoot them a question and when they got some free time they answer your freaking question it's great it's quick i'm not always right mm -hmm. away when you message me if you're if you catch me at the right time and and you're you know pretty high in the list sometimes i get to you right away but don't be offended if i take a day to respond i promise i'm not ignoring you <laughs> i believe you oh um, sorry my cat's not not letting me go oh that's fine all right there we go sit there all right duck man again just a quick uh i i, I feel you i yeah. have to be on there because i want people who are on facebook to to know i exist 
But yeah, that's pretty much my thought as well. Yeah, I'm dark on Facebook. I don't think you'll ever get a response from me yeah. there. Um, Instagram or email, that's that's the best you got, or a phone call. <laughs> yeah. All right, we didn't talk about this, but I like where Wobbly Quark's head's at. Wobbly Quark wants to know, any secret discount codes? Oh, okay. So yes, I do have one that I give out uh, myself, and that's Micro 10. So if you want to put in the discount code Micro 10, that's still active, you get 10% off. Nice. But there's also people, if you want to support some affiliates and you've got people that you're following, check their profiles. I, I can't name who because if I, if I say who specifically, then I'm giving one over sure. the other. Yeah. But if you see any affiliate links, you know they get, they get a kick, and I'd rather you do that. It doesn't cost you anything else. So if you see any affiliates repping a link of mine, then you know pay them a visit through there. It's better to do that. Nice. All right. I think we're getting caught up on questions. Um, I've thoroughly enjoyed this. Um, I, I loved every, so far, every product I've bought from you, I'm definitely going to be trying, uh, your, your hydrophobic. I need more hydrophobic filter patches in my life. I think. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. All right, man. Uh, thank you very much. Um, we're going to ride out with some music here. Um, but I really appreciate you taking the time. I know you're busy. I know you have to now, um, help uh, Tim climb trees and try to cut down uh, mushrooms and all the weird stuff that he, he now probably uh, exposes you to on a daily basis. Yeah. We're a slave to each other's whims. What are you going to do? What are you going to do? <laughs> all right, man. Well, thank you again. I appreciate you having me on. All right. You take care. Have a good one. Coming in live from the basement of my small ranch home in Akron, Ohio. I was tripping in college, can't believe I took a trip and later on got some knowledge. Did a little word, walked out, got some dollars. If you come on bad, then the shoes make it holler. We do the research round here. Should talk you for the soul when it's no fear. Psychedelic universe in a new gear. You can feel the power rise when you come near. Oh, magic mushroom, can you give me more power? Super Mario, I'm about to be Bowser. Was chilling with a turtle while sitting in the shower. On my GameCube that I fixed in an hour. Then I heard this podcast, nothing you can bypass. Heard how to grow, then I told myself right that. All the real people listen. Put it in the word, cause you know what's the mission. Yeah. I'll just be tripping up. I'm a fun guy, I'm a fun guy. I'll just be tripping up. Lions made for a tough night. I'll just be tripping up. Going shows with my college. I'll just be tripping up. Out of where will my body be? I'll just be tripping up. I'm a fun guy, I'm a fun guy. I'll just be tripping up. Lions made for a tough night. I'll just be tripping up. Going shows with my college. I'll just be tripping up. All right, guys, if you want to come hang out and chat a little bit uh, in the Discord, uh, I'm sure a few of us will be over there. <laughs>